You're watching JCT TV. This is Bible study for the 21st century. So here we are in Matthew, and for those of you who are faithful watchers of JCT TV, you know that we went through Matthew, what, five years ago? Has it been that long? I take my time going through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and John. Acts to me is volume two of Luke, so it's a part of the Gospels, big time for me at least. But we're back at Matthew, and it's not just a repeat, it's a repeat of the text, but it's not a repeat necessarily of commentary. I hope you'll enjoy it. Wow, working for orphans and widows has been caring for orphans and widows in Africa and India for over 20 years. Key to its vision is partnership with local champions who engage hundreds of church-based volunteers in home-based care. Care for the sick and the dying in their own humble homes. They are defenseless and afflicted. They are the least of these that Jesus would have us love and care for. Our partner champions are based in South Africa, Zambia, Malawi, and India. They provide faithful, accountable, and godly care for thousands. Together with WOW, they truly are the hands and feet of Jesus to the sick and the dying. Founder and President Jim Candelon has been committed to both teaching the gospel via Jim Candelon Today TV and practicing the gospel through WOW. WOW is a proven ministry. We are grateful for your support. Call, write, or log on to wowmission.com and be inspired. So last time, friends, we just got into Matthew chapter 2 where the very, uh, I would say, quick summary of not only the, uh, the birth of Jesus in chapter 1, but also the quick summary of what happened in Bethlehem occurs. Uh, Matthew doesn't uh, take any time to, uh, like Luke does, to give us a lot of detail. But there's enough detail here that we were able to focus on a few things last program. We looked at uh, Bethlehem, we looked at the wise man or the magi, and we also looked at the star. Uh, and now we're going to look at Herod the, uh, the Great. But just to add a bit of historical context, at that time, there was a synergy of both religious and secular hope or expectation that a kingly figure would emerge from somewhere in the Mediterranean basin and rule the world. The Jewish messianic hope, which uh, had been backburnered, if you will, for 400 years by prophetic silence, was beginning to percolate again. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote about that time one from their country should become governor of the habitable earth. I'm quoting him there. One from their country should become governor of the habitable earth. You know, Josephus is pretty much uh, the classic history of that period of time. Um, and you can still get Josephus on the internet. It's not easy reading. You know, it's old style, but boy, is it fascinating. He, he gives you, you know, insights uh, from the outside context from which we find our biblical scriptures that is so valuable. Anyway, there were other Roman historians like um, uh, Suetonius and Tacitus who also bear witness to this Mediterranean-centric hope for universal reign. Um, it was at that very moment, if you might want to call it, a kind of an eschatological perfect storm, okay? All of the expectation was there. All the, all the excitement was there. Okay, so... Enter Herod. Now, look at verse 7. I, I read it last time, but I, I'll read it again. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report him to me, so that I too may go and worship him. We know, of course, that's not exactly what he wanted. 
He want, didn't want to worship, he wanted to kill. So here we have Herod. He, he's called the great because he was a great builder. He really was outstanding. He was nonetheless one of the most pathetic uh, persons of his day. Uh, for one thing, he was desperately insecure. Uh, much of this was rooted in his half-breed status. Uh, he was half Jew and half Idumean. Uh, Idumean coming from Edom, which is that huge country or territory to the southeast of uh, Israel that was founded by Jacob's brother Esau. Um, he had Esau's blood in his veins. Um, and as such, he was looked down upon by his Jewish subjects. And as is often the case, this insecurity led a, a troubling paranoia. Uh, in his old age, he became a murderous old man, as he's been described by some historians, a murderous old man, murdering his wife, Mariamne, her mother, Alexandra, three of his sons, uh, Antipater, Alexander, and Aristobulus. He murdered all 70 of the Sanhedrin, who were the ruling council of Jerusalem. You know, these would be the, like the Senate, you know, of the government. Killed them all. He killed 300 court officers and countless others. In fact, he killed so many people that the Roman Emperor Augustus said it was safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. So, he'd been appointed governor uh, of Palestine in 47 BC. Uh, he became king in 40 BC and reigned until 4, B, uh, 4 BC. So he was the only uh, Roman ruler of Palestine to keep the peace during that period of time. And part of his, his, his success was due, no doubt, to his generous care of the poor. He was very kind to the poor. But it was he who, in the Christmas story, ordered what we now call the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. What a story. Okay. Um, In fact, I read it last week, but let me read it again. Um, well, let, let's, pick it, let's pick it up in verse 13. When they had gone, the Magi had gone, on, uh, you know, on another route. They, they heard that Herod wanted to kill people, uh, especially children. Uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Now this is the second time, the second time that an angel gave instructions to Joseph. And as husband and protector of Mary and the newborn baby, he was told, quote, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. And this was to avoid Herod's murderous activity, which was to follow, which we'll read about here in a moment. Now, you know, we read a couple of sentences like this and tend to watch the action like we do a movie. Um, the scenes shift from moment to moment, from place to place. And sometimes, from time, to time zone to time zone, in the flash of an editor's cut, okay? But we need to slow down here. To go from Bethlehem to Egypt, probably Alexandria, which is on the northern coast of Egypt. It takes at least 12 hours to drive. Now, it might take three hours to fly, but it takes 12 hours at least to drive because the roads are every which way, up and down and around and about, uh, and there's borders and there's, there's checkpoints. And so it takes at least 12 hours to, to drive it. So for Joseph and Mary with their little donkey to walk from Bethlehem to Alexandria, well, you, you, you figure it out. Would it be 10 times as slow as driving? Probably. What's that, 120 hours? Maybe more. It took a long time to get there. But Egypt was a haven for Jews in, in that period of time, um, and had been, really, over the centuries. Alexandria alone housed about 1 million Jews in the first century. And every town and village in Egypt had Jewish citizens. In Egypt, a Jewish immigrant uh, would find synagogues, markets, housing and food that provided seamless uh, transition. And ironically, 
a Jew could feel at home in Egypt. Yes, the Exodus had been about escape from Egypt, but then Hosea says, out of Egypt I called my son. Hello, what's that? Well, does that mean he called Israel out of Egypt? That's one application. But there's a messianic application as well. And Matthew applies that messianic application to what was happening with the Christ child. With his parents, he would emigrate to Egypt and later migrate back to Palestine. And for a time, Egypt was the Messiah's protector. How cool is that? Okay, let's pick up in verse 16. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was fulfilled through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Why two years and under? Well, because Herod, you know, he, he could do math like we could do math. And when he heard from the Magi, he realized that they'd been on the road for almost two years. Walking from Kurdistan or Azerbaijan or wherever it was, all the way down to Palestine. Uh, so if this baby had been born when the star appeared to them, then it means that this Messiah figure was maybe two years of age. We also read he was living in a house. That, that's a whole other story, which I'll deal with, you know, when we do the Christmas story in Luke. <laughs> Who knows how many months from now? Nevertheless, uh, everyone two years of age and under, boys only, he has them slaughtered. Um, you know, it, it's surprising to me that Herod's paranoia had not fueled more efficient intelligence gathering. You know, he had sent no police with the Magi, nor did he commission any of his officials to follow the star to Bethlehem. He just basically said to the Magi, you let me know once you found the baby king. But in his rage at being deceived by the Magi, when they didn't let him know, they didn't come back, and they went back to their homeland another way, his paranoia and cruelty kicks into gear. He orders every male child in Bethlehem region under the age of two to be killed. And of course, None of our Christmas traditions really reference this unspeakable tragedy. Uh, we focus on one baby and we forget the others. I don't think we should forget. Jesus' birth came at a great cost. Uh, his life came at a great cost. His death on Calvary came at a huge cost. Um, this is a serious story. This is not some little, you know, bedtime nursery story. This is a story that is rooted in salvation history. And it grips me, as I'm sure it grips you, because our spiritual well-being is predicated on what's taking place here at this very early stage in the life of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. For over 20 years, WOW, working for orphans and widows, has been caring for vulnerable and at-risk women and children hard hit by the HIV and AIDS pandemic in Africa and India. WOW engages with local partner champions and church-based volunteers in the care of the desperately needy. Now, in recent months, we have expanded our reach to Ukraine. Over 8 million refugees have fled the ravages of that war-torn country mostly women and children, including many orphans. Our partner in East Europe tells us of the busing of Ukrainian orphans through the night to safety. Churches have become refugee centers, opening their buildings to become safe havens in the rescue. And WOW has come alongside. We have begun supporting this rescue work, but there is so much more that we must provide to these heroic churches. They need funding to continue for hundreds of orphans yet to come. We may be only small players, but you can partner with us in the rescue of Ukrainian orphans. WOW is a proven ministry. We are grateful for your support. Call, write, or log on to wowmission.com.
Now, mentioning this slaughter of the innocents, um, Matthew captures the sorrow and heartbreak of the mothers by quoting Jeremiah 31, verse 15. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, Rachel, of course, was the much-loved second wife of Isaac and the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. Uh, and one of Joseph's sons was named Ephraim. And Rama, centuries later, was an Ephraimite town uh, not far from Jerusalem. Um, so when Jeremiah penned those words, he was probably thinking of Israel exiled to Babylon. But Matthew sees a proper double meaning here, and he uses it without apology. You know, the exalted sounds of the angelic announcement of Jesus' birth is followed a year or so later by the wailing of the bereaved. Huge sorrow, a stark juxtaposition, to say the least. Okay, let's pick it up in verse 19 of chapter 2. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who, are trying to take the, who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, Joseph, this uh, remarkable man, like his patriarchal namesake, was a dreamer. Uh, here in these four verses of scripture, we read of a third and then a fourth directive dream. And Joseph receives from the Lord these dreams, and the third one instructs him to go back to Israel. The fourth moves him and his young family onto the region of the Lord Galilee to a town called Nazareth. And it was here that Jesus lived the next 30 years of his life working as a carpenter and probably a stonemason side by side with his mentor, his father Joseph, and we can only imagine the conversations, the family meals, the fellowship with friends and neighbors uh, that helped shape the emerging Messiah. Now, Nazareth was and is, in many ways, still an inconsequential, nondescript town. And if you're watching me on the internet in Nazareth, uh, no offense, but I've been in Nazareth many times uh, over the years. Um, in fact, uh, my uh, executive assistant when I was pastoring in Jerusalem with her husband, who is one of the world's foremost uh, Dead Sea Scrolls archaeologists, they actually created what's called the Biblical Village in Nazareth. It's beautiful. You go to Nazareth and you visit this Biblical Village and people are walking around in Biblical clothing and there's the animals from that time and there's little stalls and little uh, uh, craft shops. And I mean, it's, it's like you're walking back to, you know, 2,000 years. But in general, uh, there's nothing remarkable about Nazareth. Um, I find it kind of cramped and noisy, and, and in many ways it's very Middle Eastern. So there you have it. But it's situated on a range of hills overlooking the Jezreel Valley, and its only distinction at Jesus' time was its proximity to international trade routes. Uh, the road to the sea used to come through there and up through um, the Galilee to Capernaum and on its way up into um, uh, Asia, um, Mesopotamia, you know, um, all of those regions uh, north of uh, modern day Iraq uh, and, and, and beyond. So it was a trading town. It was also a frontier town uh, out of the mainstream, marked with a peculiar accent, kind of like, you know, some regional places, especially in the United States, where there's a distinct, you know, um, accent, Kentucky accent, or South Carolina accent, or Texas accent. Mind you, there's so much um, travel back and forth of people moving from the north to the east and the west to the south. It's hard to find a pure accent anymore, but nevertheless, it was like that here. Uh, the Galilean accent was very distinct. Um, in fact, Nazareth and Nazarenes were looked down on with scorn by the Jewish world to the south of them. They would recognize the accent and they would say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, this was a common slight that they used to make. So even the moniker, Jesus of Nazareth, 
had a certain innuendo. Yes, he was from Nazareth, but he was also from Nazareth. You know, he's one of those strange guys with a weird accent. Um, so he's not to be taken seriously. He's, you know, he's, 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 he's countrified. You know, it's interesting for my wife and I and our three, three kids, it took a little bit of getting a little bit of getting used to when we first moved to Jerusalem back in the uh, in 1981, when uh, our neighbors introducing us to other neighbors would refer to us as Notzrim, which means uh, from Nazareth or Nazarethites. Uh, a Christian is a is is known as a, no, a, notz, a Notzrim. He's he's uh, right away he's he's got that um, certain smear, if you will, culturally, historically, and in this case, religiously, because he's from Nazareth. He's a Notsri. Um, not much good, you know. <laughs> and I, I always felt slightly diminished, but I got over it. Nevertheless, that's where Jesus grew up, and that's what makes Nazareth a name of honor to this day. He was called a Nazarene. So, you know, <laughs> from the gospel side of things, for me to be referred to as a Notsri, or my family is not stream. It's an honor. Anyway, that's Nazareth. Now let's pick it up. Uh, let's go on here to chapter three. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're good. We're good. Okay. Um, let's read. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had leather, a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, I'm no John the Baptist, but I had to add a little bit of energy to that because it was a pretty aggressive speech he was making. He was Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Um, he just became called the Baptist. Um, he was just a few months older, and unlike Jesus, had spent most of his young life uh, in the desert. In fact, he had become a bit of a wild man in the sense that his, uh, his clothing, his diet, his ministry even, uh, were all offensive to city dwellers. He smelled like a camel, <laughs> whose hair he had fashioned into a shirt. He ate whatever he could find, locusts and wild honey. And, and, and then he was preaching cutting sermons against priests, tax collectors, soldiers. He seemed a throwback to the prophets of Israel's ancient history, which indeed he was. He was like the last of the Old Testament era prophets. Even though there'd been a 400 year gap, here that prophetic voice was being raised once again, calling the world to account. So he calls to the city and the town folk, Come and join in the desert. He baptizes them in the Jordan River, a symbol of the cleansing of repentance. But when Pharisees, Sadducees, tax collectors, and soldiers come to hear him, he excoriates them, referring to them as snakes fleeing a grass fire. Why was he so hard on them? For one, they were collaborator, collaborators with the Roman uh, imp, imp occupiers. Uh, the priestly classes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, had compromised temple worship. The tax collectors were working for the occupiers, gouging their own people with surcharges. Uh, and the soldiers were enforcing occupation law, although some commentators see them as insurgents who, because of their poor pay, uh, were forcing their own people to support them. Jesus and John ministered in a tumultuous time. The people's hopes for a peaceful, triumphal messianic era were all but dashed, and all they could expect was subjugation by foreign powers. They grumbled and rumbled. Chaos was a heartbeat away. We've got to remember this, friends. This was the real world at that time. 
And we look at our world right now and see the mess our world is in right now, whether it's, you know, environmentally or politically, uh, you know, volcanoes, floods, wildfires, wars between nations, uh, savage famines, uh, horrible, horrible uh, diseases. You know, well, not much has changed. In Jesus and John the Baptist time, the world was in tumult then too. In the midst of the tumult, maybe because of the tumult, was this hope for deliverance from heaven. And so John was preparing the people of Israel for that exact moment when Messiah would appear. And he's about to baptize the Messiah himself. Wow. Working for Orphans and Widows is a trusted Christian charity reaching out to the sick and the dying, the least of these in pandemic-stricken Africa and India. For over 22 years, Jim and Kathy Canelon have engaged with community-based champions and church volunteers in the care for those whom Jim calls society's weakest link. Everything from home-based palliative care to the rescue and protection of young women and girls who are victims of abuse is done in the name of Jesus and is overseen by local partner champions and an army of church-based volunteers. WOW has a proven track record. Check it out on wowmission.com. Or, if you wish, you can call or write to us. Its sustainability is dependent on the support of faithful friends like you. So friends, when you're watching JCT, you see these breaks, and during the breaks we promote WOW, Working for Orphans and Widows. This was something that my wife and I established 23 years ago, working at the time in Sub-Saharan Africa with um, orphans and widows impacted by HIV and AIDS, and then over the last few years, complicated with COVID-19, all kinds of opportunistic diseases, horrible poverty-related afflictions, and we've been doing that faithfully now for 23 years. Um, but we've also been working in Ukraine since the war began. And here's a few pics. You know, your support goes a long way. And uh, some of the elderly widows we are helping with food and medicine. And uh, you see them holding books there. Well, those are Ukrainian Bibles. Um, some of the younger widows as well, uh, standing there holding up their medicine and their Bible. And how's this? A chocolate bar and a Bible for a cute little four or five year old. Thank you, friends, for helping us. <laughs> 